construction, uh, including shared use pathways for stormwater management improvements uh, is at the riverfront area of the uh, Dana Road. Uh, notice of intent for slip lining existing culverts is on uh, the Northampton DPW Bridge of the Road. Uh, request for determination of applicability, determining resource areas are accurately delineated uh, this uh, solar project. Also on Birch Pit Road, a, a notice of intent for parking lot expansion and road stormwater improvements, uh, Northampton Pediatrics on Lowth Street, uh, and notice of intent for construction of a large scale ground mounted solar for the Voltaic Array on uh, Park Hill Road. And lastly, uh, notice of intent for construction of a medical marijuana facility and related site improvements within the riverfront area uh, of Brian Road. Uh, first is we had uh, Sarah, you said two sets of minutes, uh, both say, for say back in May, uh, executive session and uh, regular. Can I uh, uh, put a motion for approval of the regular session? I was not there. I called in for the executive session. Move to approve. Any modification? Second? Second. Any modifications, amendments? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. And for the executive session? Uh, motion to approve? Second. So and the second? Second. Any amendments and modifications? There was, Sarah, uh, in that one I saw an incomplete sentence, as I recall. I didn't print it out. So uh, it just needed the last, whatever it was, uh, I forget what word it ended at, but it didn't seem to be. Oh, the commission will need to be right. as clear as possible regarding the reasons for denial. The, the court is requesting discussions of. Right, and there was a, it broke somewhere. So with that, assuming that will be amended and completed, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. Uh, so, first case, uh, uh, oh, first, any general public comments not related to a specific case? If not, uh, first case, notice of intent for roadway reconstruction, including shared use path creation and stormwater management improvements uh, this, uh, at the uh, riverfront area of the Connecticut River. This is uh, requested uh, continuation without discussion until October 11th, so and we already have a time specified? Yes. Okay, so so we, want to make, we need a motion on that. We do. To move that. Anybody want to make that as a motion to move that case to October 11th at 550? So moved. And a second? Sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 So voted. So now 545, notice of intent for slip lining of existing culverts. Uh, work includes impacts to bank, bordering vegetative wetland, and underwater and riverfront. And the main tributary to Parsons Brook. The applicant is not handling the DPW. Yep. Good. Hi. Hi. Uh, Chris Baker, engineer of the DPW, and I also have John Stacey, um, who did the wetlands donation on the project. Um, we have um, so, um, just an overview of the project. Um, we're planning to pave Birds Pit Road um, in the spring of 2019. Um, ahead of that, we'd like to repair two culvert crossings, stream crossings along the road. Um, the first one is a 48 inch um, corrugated metal pipe that's just west of Rural Lane. Um, and then there's a twin 36 inch ovalized stampedes that are um, just west of Woods Road on that stretch and um, we evaluated the culverts for replacement and found their condition to be acceptable for slip lining. So instead of um, spending the money to replace the culverts fully, we're looking to slip on them with HDPE inserts. Um, so they'll just be grouted around, a smaller pipe will be inserted into the corrugated metal pipe um, just to extend the longevity of the pipes. Um, completed an H&H &H analysis on them. So there's there's no impact to, since you're going from a corrugated interior metal pipe to a smooth plastic pipe, even though the diameter is smaller, there's um, not an impact to roadway flooding under the 10-year storm. Uh, there's still free board on the road in that case. So 
there's there's really not a significant impact to the hydrology because you get the additional capacity from the smooth interior. What, what conditions would uh, uh, render an existing conduit inappropriate? Is it just if there were root intrusions and things like that? Or? Yep, exactly. So if there's if there's breaking or if the yeah, if the pipe is severed and the angles, right. if they actually if the pipe that they were able to slip line with it became so small because of like what you said, a cave ins or it's squishing to a particular dimension, then that would no longer work because you'd have to go to such a small pipe. Which I think they've seen. If the joints start separating and it, there's vertical or horizontal misalignment, then it, it wouldn't work for slip lining. And do you send a camera through first to determine this? Or we did, it? yeah. And this one um, is not, you can tell by actually just looking down it, its alignment. But um, yeah, the ovalized pipes are a little more difficult, obviously, because they have a pipe arch shape to them. So we're in, you know, inserting elliptical into a pipe arch shape so it doesn't exactly match, um, but we're doing the best we can. So that's why you went with a small, the uh, much smaller diameter on the, on the ovals. Yeah, the, what, so those started out as a effective 36 inch and they're going down to a 30 inch, but because of the fact that we're getting the smooth interior, the hydraulics yeah. work out, that is passing the same flow, so. So there's not much work being done on the head wall? There is a head wall that's going to be put in. Um, the um, both pipes are getting essentially um, a bell inlet, just to improve the efficiency of the inlet conditions for just flow improvement through the pipe. So um, the 48 inch, uh, the there's a product where it's actually a bell inlet that can just be snapped on, essentially to the end of the pipe. Uh, the ovalized make it much more difficult. There's not a pre-manufactured product for that. So that's where the head wall comes into play. So we will be constructing a head wall only on the inlet side of that so that it can be beveled and help the, um, basically the flow through the pipe to improve the efficiency of that. How long do you expect uh, the work to take? Um, um, Probably, I think probably a week, but it could be up to two weeks. A week at each site or? or? Um, it could be a week total, um, depending on, I haven't talked to, we just got the bids back today. And haven't, we haven't awarded the contract, so I haven't been able to talk to the contractor about it. I'm imagining they work fairly efficiently on these because you basically just set up a, equipment and push the pipes mm -hmm. in and then fill it with grout. So it's, it's not a long process. The addition of the head wall, might push it into a two-week process. That will be done this fall? That's the plan. Yeah, we're waiting on our um, Army Corps permit as well as this permit. So um, it's, it's just pending that. But we do have the bids already in, so we're ready to award it. And we're hoping to finish it this fall. Um, no, this was um, because Burt's Pit is being paved. We did a culvert evaluation of all the culverts along the road, so that's why these that's why these are happening because of the, the planned paving work. Any other questions from the commissioners? Sarah, is this one you were uh, you should. You make sure that the right type of receiving. What am I reading the wrong case? Yeah, no, that is that one. So there, there was an upland seed mix proposed for yep. replacement, but it seemed like that was awfully close to resource area, and I wasn't sure if that would make sense for this project. Okay. Um, yeah, we basically had the wetland seed mix within the resource areas, and then the conservation seed mix outside. But we can have them replant. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't think there's going to be that much disturbance. I mean, they're just, they're basically going to get the equipment yeah. down into the brook to align with the pipe. I just wanted to make sure there was enough work area. I'm not sure exactly how they want to access it, but it's really just going to be getting their vehicles down there. So there shouldn't be, it should probably, you know, just be like a eight foot wide swath that's disturbed. 
Would you prefer that just the one on seed mix got planted? Oh, just everywhere. It, it doesn't matter, just, but just to make sure that it's the correct seed mix that we'll actually take. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was also wondering if there was any possibility for removal of invasives. Invasives while you're at it. Um, that's uh, unfortunately if they're in the way. already not in the contract, but okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> you can maybe have them try and pull some things if there's something like not weed or bittersweet or something that's, I don't know, it, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking. Uh, contractors usually try and minimize tree removal, but in this case, if the tree yeah, is like we'll just pull it out, something yeah. But no, yeah, we weren't we weren't really mixing. So it's usually typically a landscape company would do that, and this is like a specialized pipe company, so it's not really similar work. And yeah, how how big is the equipment that actually? I actually am not sure. I haven't, I haven't actually seen one of these go in. Um, but my understanding is, yeah, they set up um, their equipment and they basically just direct push eight foot lengths of pipe yeah, in. Right. So, yeah. So it's a, it's a, it, you don't need a 40 foot length and find a place. No, 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 no. no. Connect no. Small yeah, pieces. yeah, they snap together or, yeah, or have bells on them. And then they just trim and grout the annulus around the Yep, exactly. Yep. Yeah, they just um, insert tubes all the way down and just use annular grout in between. And they put two by fours in to kind of center it all before they, they fill it with grout and then pull everything out. They just pump that in. They just pump it in, yeah. Any other questions from commissioners? Questions or comments from the public? If not, motion to close. Motion to close. And the second? Second. And the third? Aye. Aye. Um, seems relatively straightforward. Um, yeah, this is the one we're going to ask them to see if there's any invasives to take out while they're at it, but other than that, that's, they can't, can't really make that into an official condition. I think. No. Uh, other than that, uh, motion to approve? As far as the uh, seed selection, just the seed that's appropriate for the type of soil. If they're in a wetland area, they right. a wetland scene, then seen. they'll have to exercise judgment as they see where they're actually placing the seeds. So we can add that as a condition. Anything else? No. Mm -hmm. uh, make a motion to approve with that uh, standard conditions plus that uh, additional. And a second? Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. All Thank set? You very much. Thanks.
essential to this location. It's, we're oriented incorrectly here. We have Words Pit Road to the north, um, the residential community to the south. It's a previous sand and gravel operation on the parcel. And we were looking at a small segment of the overall 212 acre piece, essentially the delineation comprised. Um, it was originally 78 acres, and then it was less than two. I think the actual site is probably about 50, 50 acres of delineation. But you can see, um, again, we're, the north is to the right here. Found demarcated in the field with flagging. Essentially, we're looking at a coincident boundary of BPW and mean high water in the location in the eastern portion of the site. And as you move further west, um, the riverfront area ends as the area, as the perennial stream um, conditions increase and we have a pond of condition to the west in the old gravel, um, gravel pond. Um, and it continues to the south and wraps around. And I believe you've looked at wetlands on the adjacent parcel to the west previously. Um, I have been, in addition to these systems, we do have an isolated ordinance protected wetland along the southern property boundary. This is an area that's an isolated wetland. Um, it's vegetated in its entirety. We're not seeing seasonal, seasonal inundation there, so we're not looking at this area as potential for a pool habitat, um, but it isn't a wetland to protect under your ordinance as, a, as an isolated wetland feature. Um, the remainder of the site is vegetated. There's, um, with the exception of the previous borrow area, there's a variety of scrub vegetation. Vegetation along the wetland is variable between the areas um, within that, that are subject to more obligate species, adjacent, right adjacent to the perennial stream corridor. As you transition up, um, you have sort of a successional shrub mix, um, a lot of willows and alders with a record of previous disturbance, um, but it's quite vegetated, high quality wetland systems um, in this portion of the property. I'm happy to answer any questions, just want to provide a, a, a brief overview for you. Um, and I can leave that to this representation, so I'm happy to open it up to, the, to you all for questions. I understand your commission agent have walked the property earlier in the week. We've um, discussed that on the phone. Um, questions from commission? Mm -hmm. <laughs> My concern is with the access, I guess. Um, you're coming from another property parcel on to this one. You mean in terms of do I have permission to flag or where were you looking at where are you going with um, that? It's it's you're you're gonna have to walk cross through a floodplain I guess. Um we're not actually so nothing's proposed with this plan. We're just looking at resource areas tonight. We're not looking okay. at, at actual um any kind of you know initiated activities. Um in terms of access, so with the previous use of the site, there are there are roadways and, and crosses throughout throughout the property. Okay, I just didn't know if we were going to end up in a situation where you're having to cross through another property to get to this one. Right. I don't, I I couldn't. I actually couldn't um, okay. answer that, but I would believe that all of those issues could be squared away before we get to that. Well, I just <clears throat> just mentioned in there access was from another property in your presentation. Oh, did it? In my report? Yeah, it says, uh, well, in the application here, it says access is going to be from the property of the west. Right, well, they're, they're contiguous now. There's there's a parcel that's, that's butt into the west. Is, we're looking at the entirety was 212 acres, but we're looking at a small portion of it. Okay. If if I may speak to that, Mike Gagnon from Malone McGrone. So, if I may flip this around, so there's a match line right across yep. the top of the sheet here. Yeah. So, if you look, this is actually the adjacent uh, Turnberry piece that was flagged by others. So, the primary access into the property um, is the paved driveway in this location here off of the mm -hmm. Birds Pit Road. And ultimately, to answer your question, is there will be an access easement okay. um, that will be granted um, for the for our property, and there will be a combination access and ultimately utility easement that more or less will follow the existing access road. Um, there's a bunch of proposed infrastructure that's associated with the other site. I don't have those details with me tonight. Right. Um, the only other access to the property, believe it or not, is. <coughs> 
Um, our particular piece is like a flag lot. This is actually the outline. Yeah, that's right here. the uh, axis is what I was looking Yeah, at. and there's actually, if you look at it, this, there, this is like a flag lot, and it actually narrows down so that the way it works by road, it's only about a 20 foot wide. Yeah, it looks pretty um, scary. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that was the only place I could post the sign, by the way. Right. So, and, and, and there's a lot of flood plain you have to cross. Uh, Right, not to mention wetlands, right. yeah, if you wanted to come into the Plus, you'd have to take a look at the flying. Right, I mean, yeah. again, nothing is proposed with that, you know, in terms of the, this, at this point, we're just looking to verify the results. Well, that's why I, I was asking that question. Because if and it, I apologize for it. If it didn't mean you'd you have to use some, you know, the legal access that was shown on there. Understood, understood, yeah, that's a good point. Other questions from the And Terry, you know, you walked it and... Did. Uh, it was very wet. <laughs> I couldn't say when I went, unfortunately. But I didn't have any issues with any of the flying. The commission just wants to be careful in the determination to note that it's only GEX2 that's being confirmed because there ended up not actually being any weapon flags on the GEX1 because of, that was already confirmed as part of the weapon determination. Yeah. Right. Any other questions from the commissioners? Questions or comments from the public? If not, the motion to close the hearing. So and a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, also seems straightforward that the determination or the delineation is flagged accurately in Sarah's opinion and uh, to add a note that it's the X2 shoot that that's the uh, flag on the saying say is correct. So that would be check check box one, the area subject to the act. 2A to indicate the boundaries are accurate in box five, that the area is subject to the wetlands ordinance. And then noting that the isolated wetland is only subject to the ordinance, not the wetlands protection. Uh -huh. right. So I want to make a motion to that effect. And a second? Second. Further discussion? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So voted. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Water um, 
Hey, water. Uh, so at this point, we're we'll, going to close with the storm water here. It's just to bring it over and put it down this um, a waterway. The end of it is currently eroded. There's a tree right at the end right here. Um, so what I'm proposing is that we'll put the outfall there. We'll also fill the, the eroded area with fabric and riprap to protect that. And the tree will actually end up holding the wall in place very nicely. So we'll solve a couple of things. So um, we've got standard um, road controls, track pad, sediment fence around the, the work areas. Um, because it is in the buffer zone, um, we are also providing some mitigation for, you know, it does barely touches into the buffer zone. We've got some temporary impacts over here. But um, we've got a bunch of invasives management proposed for the bank. Oh, yeah. That slope is uh, fairly steep up the It is. Yeah, very side. Steep. It is, yeah. Okay. I believe the whole I believe this whole area is pretty much filled. That's why it's so steep. And what's what's the foliage there now? Uh it's a it's mostly tree. Uh you got a bunch of knotweed growing up on the upper upper banks. Yeah. You know, just and so we cleared off and replaced with I see the, the trees up uh, Further, but uh, on, on the slope itself, what do, what do you think? Uh, the slope is, for the most part, going to be left intact. You know, looking at doing any major impacts to the slope other than just this little outfall in here. Um, I, I wouldn't want to get into trying to clear too much out of it. It's folding nicely the way it is. Okay. Do you propose plantings for the removal areas just to keep the invasives from coming back? I guess. Um, uh, Andy Bone did the planting plan. Um, so at this point, I believe we're just removing um, the invasives and treating, treating the areas. Um, yeah, I don't believe he's got any proposed planting. In the, <clears throat> so on the plan you're going to rebuild the uh, paved waterway? Yeah. Are you going to do anything with the uh, drainage soil in the back, which you know, seems to be highlighted on the plans? I wasn't sure. No, no, that's just that's what it is. It, it's just Andy noted that there were some some of the invasives growing up in that area, nice. just to clean it out. Um, most, you know, the majority of the vegetation is going to stay. The most of the, you know, I think there may be some. Invasives that creep down the bank, but for the most part, it's all just on the upper edge. Yeah, that's a snow storage location. Yeah. And most of the proposed addition is also in the buffer zone. Too. Uh, addition? No, oh, this this thing? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's all paved right now. Yes, it's a subsurface chamber. Um, basically, you know, I'm proposing it. It's a Coltec V8. Um, I believe I've got two chambers in here, mm -hmm. um, one after another. Um, put in stone. Um, did in, I did encounter in doing test pits here. I found you know, fill material and bricks that would be pulling out and replacing with appropriate gravel underneath it. Um, but 
It's a, it has a board sentry, so the water, it's just over, overland flow across the parking lot through the board sentry unit. Basically, this, this is getting, just the new area is getting picked up by the water quality unit. The remaining areas will continue to flow the way they are currently. Um, and uh, so it goes into the Holtec system. There's some detention, some infiltration, and then it goes through a public control unit. So the the outlet unit is essentially it shoots up a pipe and more flows. Or is the outlet control? Yeah. The outlet control just yeah it has a, an outlet pipe that comes into the center of the structure with an elbow and a riser, okay. and it has orifices poured into it for the different storm events. None of this meets the stormwater standards currently, correct? Correct? Because it all predated the yeah. requirement. Are you, are you also doing uh, rock wall work? Yeah, there's a retaining wall on here. Four foot retaining wall. Oh, that's almost all. Yeah, the majority of it's not in the How long do you think this project will take? For it to be done, it'll probably take about a month. This year, or? no, it'll probably go next year. In, in the uh, present situation, is, is salt used on that uh, parking lot in the winter? Uh, I believe that it, it's it's probably CNN salt. CNN salt. CNN salt. A CNN salt mix. Oh. Yeah. This is uh, once we get a, a, a whack at it, uh, that to limit or uh, eliminate uh, salt flow into the uh, wetland, yeah. um, we like to do when we can. Right. You got to go after the city for that. Since yeah, that's all they use is salt. The city doesn't sand anymore. I know it's just yeah. salt. <laughs> Well, there's benefits from the problem. Yeah. Other questions from commissioners? Questions or comments from the public? If not, motion to close. Second. And the second? Second. All in favor? Aye. So, um, the question from DEP had been that the soil types hadn't been properly analyzed at the time when the flow calculations were done, but now apparently they have been, Sarah, and so... Yes, you've done testing. Yeah, it's committed to you. Yeah. We found sand in the fill. So what horizon does the bridge show up? <laughs> <laughs> well, initially I thought it was on the little film and then digging down. I thought I had very topsoil there, digging down up to the bottom wall with bricks. Oh. Uh, I, I think the whole bank is still. And that would explain why it's so steep. Oh, yeah. Everything around is like that. So, Sarah, your recommendation is, uh, yes, we can uh, grant an order of conditions um, that we want to uh, add, in addition to standard conditions, a uh, periodic or one-time assessment of the stability of the riprap 
just one. So you and I had talked about the um, the dump riprap structure. We've seen uh, some issues with those on other slopes. So I, I didn't run a requirement any different, but just when you come in for a certificate of compliance, take a look at it and make sure that it's still doing okay. Yeah, that's not yeah. yeah. At the request for certificate of compliance. Um, and uh, also, the, the, the added condition about three growing seasons, 80% reduction in target invasive, photographically documented, presumably? Uh, however, this is a pretty, pretty limited project, yeah, so I, um, I didn't want to require any specific. Okay. So, uh, good faith at, at a station would be good enough? Yeah. All right, so standard conditions plus those two uh, additional. Someone want to make a motion to that? Effect? Make a motion. And a second? Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Um, Opposed? So go ahead. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. There's a, um, a solar facility up here on the old Northampton landfill as well as one over here, down here uh, just across the uh, East Hampton line. Park Hill Road runs from Glendale all the way through. Uh, the majority of it coming in from this side is paved to a cul-de-sac right, uh, shouldn't touch it, to a cul-de-sac right at this point. And coming in off of Glendale, um, there's a narrow paved road that, and the pavement ends right about there. Uh, what we're proposing to do initially uh, with the piece of land. It's about a 37 and a half acre piece of land as it sits today. Uh, we've gone out, we've delineated um, the, the riverfront uh, and the bank area of Hannah Brook, as well as some limited areas of bordering vegetative wetland that come off that. Um, the slopes along this area range from fairly shallow, is about a four or five foot slope in this area. As you come down through here and, and start to turn this corner, when you come out of the meadow and drop down to the brook, it's in some areas 20 to 30 feet. It's, it's actually quite steep through there. Um, as the brook turns and comes through here, you get a bit of a wider, um, a wider plain where, where the water spreads out during the high flow events. It crosses under Park Hill Road through a 30-inch concrete culvert and then continues on its way um, to the south. For this 37 and a half acre piece of land, um, initially we're looking to cut it up into four separate lots. So there would be two smaller lots up here that end up being about 2.8 acres each. Um, no specific plan for those. Those could be uh, retained by Sincarfa. They could be sold off as residential lots, but there's no, no development plans at this point. The third lot would be um, where we're proposing the solar facility. And then the fourth resulting lot, which is basically the rest of the land, um, and it's mostly centered on Hannum Brook, would be donated to the city of Northampton. So the limits of that really 
um, if you're looking here, run from the outer edges in this area of the riverfront, and up on this side, it runs from about here to the north, and, and all of this land up and through here. The site itself um, is, the majority of it is an open field at the moment. Um, it looks like tape occasionally. There is a central stand of trees here, but then there's a, a wooded border that, that runs around the entire perimeter of the site. So if you've been out there recently, um, one of the best ways to describe the limits of our project is if you look at the perimeter of the, of the site, um, we're not cutting any of those trees down, uh, with, a, with an exception of a small area down in the uh, southeast corner. Um, we are taking this central stand down, so that does come out. The original plan that was submitted um, featured about a four megawatt facility. Uh, we had panels that, that cover the pretty much the entire um, fielded area, and we started to fade, fade them out a little bit as we got closer to the riverfront. We did go quite a ways into the riverfront, as this plan shows. There's that 200 foot limit. Mm -hmm. um, and we also had some panels within the 100 foot uh, BBW buffer. Um, that was met with uh, some discussion, some resistance, and then one of the DEP's comments also, um, I think we also had it for staff as well, was that uh, we really need to, if we're gonna do anything in that riverfront, we really need to do an alternatives analysis. So we went through, we did a fairly comprehensive alternatives analysis um, and also followed the DEP guidelines for uh, solar facilities in preparing that. And um, it turns out this is one of those times where the alternative analysis actually comes up with something better. So what we ended up doing, this plan here shows the original layout, everything in red, all those panels and tables in red are panels that we removed. The panels in green are the panels that we added. So it's, it's basically, a, there was no net loss. So for every panel we moved, we added stuff back in here, we added down in this corner. Uh, that's what we came out with. So the result is we started with original um, riverfront impact within the, just in the areas under the panels, went from a little over 37,000 square feet down to about 16,500 square feet. So we reduced that quite a bit. Also in the, the fenced area, so just the area inside the fence, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, reduced by almost 50% as well, 113,600 down to about 59,000. So it turned out um, worthwhile. Mm. There we go. So this is the this is the site plan that we end up with. Um, as I said, we have we do have some limited panel placement in the riverfront area. Where you see this color change here, that really that's a just a graphical indication of where that fence line ends up being. So you can see it it stays in this um, outer riverfront area. It just skirts through the edge of that buffer stays out and comes out along the edge. So we pulled all the panels out of the 100 foot buffer, so we are no longer working in there. The panels themselves are supported on tables that are elevated above the ground, um, and then they're tilted from there. So the lower end of the panel is about three to four feet above the ground. The higher end of the panel, depending on the optimum um, angle that ends up being selected for the site, is probably eight, 10, 12 feet high. So once that comes up. The panels are mounted to the ground by one of two methods. Um, they're either on push poles that are pushed down into the ground, steel push poles, and then the racks are mounted on top of that. Or in some cases, um, they have to use ground screws. Uh, you can do that when there's um, usually a rockier ground. Ground screws, it's like a helical? Yep. Uh, That's exactly it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Good. Helical pile, if you will. Like yeah. um, but they're not, they're not the, sometimes you see these massive ones that are three, four feet in diameter. Um, the ones we're talking about are about that big round. I don't think we're going to have to use those on this site. Um, this has a this site has a history of agricultural use. Very very good soils. Uh, we do not find a lot of rock in here in this area. Um, and what we don't want to do is we really don't want to do a lot of uh, a lot of alteration of the ground surface itself. The other thing that we're doing in here, which um, is really not in any of these riverfront areas, but just for information, we do have an 18 foot wide gravel access road that allows the maintenance folks to get in there uh, under ideal circumstances. Uh, maintenance a couple of times a year just to make sure that the grass is down low enough, um, to make sure everything's functioning, and, then, and things like that. In the event something does go wrong with panels or some of these transformers, um, everything has a, has a remote connection, so they would get the alarm that there's a problem with it, and then some maintenance folks would come out. They come out with just pickup trucks, utility vans, things like that. 
the grading on, for this project is limited to a few area, a few small areas. Um, we have some minor grading that comes up through here, uh, uh, where the access road is. We also have a little bit of a diversion berm that we're putting where we're taking these trees down. So we're basically taking these trees down and converting the ground surface into meadow. We increase the runoff a little bit, and then working through with um, DPW on our stormwater permit, uh, we, we came up with this as one of the solutions. Uh, the other area that we're grading is right down here in the corner, and this is really just to allow the, any excess runoff that comes through to be collected here before it's brought uh, through, a, through a swale down the edge of the road. Uh, no grading throughout this whole field area. The goal here is to keep that, that field as natural as possible um, and really not try, try to not alter anything. Uh, the fence line that I mentioned earlier goes around the entire perimeter of the site. It's an eight-foot high fence, and it's got a six-inch six inch gap on the bottom. I'm sorry, how high? Eight feet. With a six inch gap on the bottom. Uh, for wildlife to go back. Uh, just this afternoon, the city signed off on our stormwater permit, so we have that in hand. Um, and this evening, after here, we're going over to talk to the planning board about this project. I have an updated set of plans that reflects everything that we've been through with the alternatives analysis and the, and the, the stormwater permit. Um, and I also have copies of that alternatives analysis as well as a, a response letter to DEP. I didn't know if those have been distributed to or not, but if you'd like copies of those, I have plenty here for you. Um, what kind of window do these things take? Can you envision panels flying into the well? Uh, I, I believe uh, it's 110. What is the standard? 110? I know it's at least 100. Okay. Um, I'd have to check the spec sheet, but um, that's studied by the racking manufacturer. Um, we have a warranty on that, and today we've been in business since 2008. We've never had a panel rip off of the racking and, and fly away. So you're cutting trees in the southeast corner. Are you planting any trees? We are. We are. So. There's two different tree ordinances that we have to be care very careful of, and it's kind of limited, has limited our placement. So um, the city has the significant tree ordinance. So anything over 20 inches, we have to replace 50% um, of the diameter. And also for this use in this zone, we're limited to 25,000 board feet, which sounds like a tremendous amount, but it turns out once you add it up, it's really not all that much. So we're actually cutting a total of 32 significant trees, 32 trees, 20 inches or more. And that's a mix of, um, of, there's of that probably a third of it are oaks, and the other two thirds are white pines. Um, to replace that and offset that, we're planting 169 trees. And it's a mix of white oak, northern red oak, American linden, and honey locusts. And those will be, oh, there we go, so all these trees in through this area. So the vast majority of them will actually be planted in the riverfront. Uh, and, then, and then we have some more that we've, we've pushed along this, this side buffer here. As far as the board footage, if you're curious, um, we're right at 20, 24,695 board feet. What's the, you mentioned the maintenance and mowing. How is that done? Um, the, the mowing is done with a, with a a fairly large mower like you would see doing a, a municipal ball field or a park or something like that and we try to limit it to once a year um, with this field we're actually kind of optimistic you know I've, I've taken a look at it several different times of the year and the highest I've seen the grass out there is about this high and then it starts to fall over so we're actually hoping once a year maximum on this particular piece. Do you use any herbicides? No herbicides, no pesticides, no fertilizers is there any slope to this parcel? There is. Um, in, let's see if I go back to this grading plan. There we go. So I don't know how well this shows up for you. Um, this is a, these are one foot contours on this plan right here. So this, this area here has a, a, a fairly steep slope. It's probably somewhere 15 to 20%. Um, it's certainly very simple. I, earlier this year when we did the tree counts and things like that, I was out there with a Jeep. Um, has no problem driving around that, that whole area. Um, but as you get up towards that 20, 25%, the racking systems that we use max out at 30%. So we really, and it's, that's almost three to one. So we really can't go any steeper than that. Fortunately, this site doesn't have it. 
The grades down in this area here are very, very gentle. They're probably on the, on the range of one to, between one and four percent. You mentioned in your introduction that these panels have a 30 year lifespan approximately. Correct. And you probably aren't the right person to ask this up, but what would be the plan for these solar panels after <coughs> their life expectancy expires? Well, that's always a subject of conversation, and nobody really knows because these, we don't know what the, the, the solar industry or solar market's going to be like in 30 years. Um, if solar is still being done in 30 years, I would hazard a guess that the panels will be a lot more efficient. So, for example, I, our firm has been doing these kinds of projects for right around 10 years now. The very first one of these we did, the, the panels were right around 100 watts each. Now the panels are three, they're three forty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the three hundred and forty. So just in that ten year span, you know, the, the efficiency has gone way up. Um, what we always do is we um, we talk about a decommissioning plan in our in our permitting documents. Um, more often than not, that has to be bonded to make sure that it doesn't be decommissioned. So right now, the plan in thirty years um, would be to see what the market's doing and. If it's, I would assume, that if it's still going, you're still going. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Um, the panels are. The panels have a warranty for 25 years. Um, so in year 25, they're warranted to operate 80 percent of what they are in day one. So they do degrade slightly over time, but still in year 30, they'll still be operating around you know 75 percent or so of what they were day one. So they'll still be producing energy, and then. Uh, as Todd said, we'll reevaluate then and, and see if we want to keep operating it or decommission it and move on. Have you already submitted your notice of change of use for the 61A? We have. We've, we've been working with Wayne on that, um, and we will be going. I'm not sure what the date of going in front of City Council on that way will be. We've been working through the city. So the, uh, the Planning Board and Conservation Commission generally provide a recommendation to City Council on that, so that would be done as part of it. Yeah. So we just got this uh, David the So you stayed outside the inner riparian, uh, uh, what would be the downside of staying outside of the tuner? Uh, simply the loss of generating capacity? That, yeah, uh, that's correct. Um, back to that. There we go. Um, so that would generally be a loss of these panels and, and push it down even more. The original interconnect agreement that was um, applied for with National Grid was for a five megawatt system. So we, we basically got permission from National Grid to do up to five megawatts here. Um, given the natural resource constraints, we're down to right around we're at four, mm -hmm. three, three, four, three, a little, little bit less than yeah. four, so three, nine or so. Um, so you know, obviously we want to get as close to five as we can. Um, Four starts to, to, to get to the point where uh, we're so far under that permitted amount that um, the off-site changes that National Grid will make them do, mm -hmm. you start to question the economic viability. Mm -hmm. So when you connect to the grid, are you setting poles along Park, Park Hill? No, that's been a lot of debate with planning staff. Um, so our understanding is that there will be no new poles allowed within the Park Hill Road right of way. So there's a series of uh, poles that come down Park Hill Road. The last one is located right here um, and splits and serves those last two houses. So we're going to have to go. Um, the, the plan right now is to have a few poles right here on site and then this area would go underground. Um, there will have to be a riser pole that comes up because that's just when you go from underground back up to the above ground, you need that, that facility. But, um, but this stretch would be underground. Sarah, have you you've been out and walked this site? Um, is there any reason for us to be uh, sticky about uh, outer riparian? This isn't a heavily disturbance. Uh, Kind of project uh, if once it's set up it's just sitting there but it's not no i mean it depends on whether the commission uh, agrees with the findings of the alternatives in the office when did we get the alternatives uh, a couple of days ago mm -hmm. I 
I've always wondered about solar panels. Does, when rain lands on a solar panel, is it increasing temperature in any way in terms of what ends up? No, because they, they stay tipped, so it, it runs off very quickly. quickly. Yeah. yeah. Is that what is the surface? Does it, the surface gets fairly hot out. I mean, even in a rainstorm, but it would it say it was sunny yesterday, it rains tomorrow. What's I, the temperature of the surface? They cool off pretty quickly. So if it's raining, it's cloudy, they're not going to be heating up. Um, I mean, if it's a sunny day, they'll cool off by half hour after the sun goes down. Mm -hmm. um, but they get warm. So if you go out there, you put your hand on on a sunny day, they heat up, you know, 100 degrees or so. But they become less efficient as they heat. Right? True. So it's, it's interesting. Kind of in the spring and the fall is when they're most efficient because it stays cool and they're not, the electrons aren't slowed down by the heat. Mm -hmm. um, so you end up getting sometimes more electricity in May than you do in July, which is kind of counterintuitive. Um, but it's the way they work. Does that commission get notice of the change of using 6U and A or just us? Just what? A? Uh, Planning Board, Consecom, ultimate approval is with the City Council. I don't know offhand if Ag Commission is required to sign up. This is, is this currently just hay yeah. by the current landowner? Yes. I, I'm actually, I'm not even sure how, how often they mow it if they do. Um, I've, been, I've been on and around the site um, starting late last fall and then all through this year. There is a, uh, a roadway that comes in and there's a fairly consistent loop that looks like somebody's driving in a trailer or something around, but I've never actually seen the grass get shorter. But ATVers have made that loop that I'm aware we'll, of. And we'll get to the I'm sorry. Uh, public part in a few minutes, okay? okay. So there's an ATV loop that kind of comes around. <laughs> 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 yes, we have a question for you, I guess is what I'm saying. It has right, been no, more than 20 years. There's just there's a protocol we have to adhere okay. to about how we proceed in this. I'm sorry. There must be a lot of runoff generated off those panels. Uh, not as much as you would think because there's there's an awful lot of gaps in there. So what happens is as the runoff comes off those panels and hits the ground, since we're not since we're not disturbing or compacting the ground, the the general um, the general runoff patterns stay the same with these. As long as you're not compacting or disturbing the ground. On a site, if, if, if we were, let's say we had to have flat, a, a flat system. So with, with some of the older racking systems and things like that, you had to have relatively flat sites. I think that we, we did one huge site years and years ago, and I think the maximum slope we could have was only 5%. So that's very flat. So we, you know, in, in that kind of situation, we would have had to grade this whole area out and make it all flat. Um, when you do that, and, you, and you're trying to spread the loam and everything, mean, you, you can't help pack the ground. So as the water comes off those panels, it, it just flies off the ground surface. When you don't have to do any grading like this, um, it just, it, it's, the ground still has that ability to absorb the rainwater that it was getting before. So it's essentially getting the same amount of rainwater that it's always got. It's just coming in stripes instead of uh, yeah, so right. we've had, had some right. really serious rain this year. Yeah. In a short amount of time. Um, if you have a two or three day rainstorm, all that water pouring you know, off into the grass. Is well, again, it's, it's, it's the same amount of rainfall that's running off into the grass. So it's you know, you get the same amount with or without the panels. Do you get any trenching where it comes off the, any trenching where it comes off the edge of the panel? Not off the panels. What we did end up doing is along the edge of this gravel no, road. Did erosive tr uh, trenching from the rain? Oh, no, 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 we don't. And again, the key to that is, is maintaining a vegetated site. Yeah. So if, if we had a site that was stripped and non-vegetated, yeah, then <laughs> every, single, every single one of those drip edges you'd see at the right. bottom right. line. But um, you know, think of typical houses that have um, you know, fairly well vegetated or shrubbery right underneath the roof lines that don't have gutters. The drip line comes right down, and, and they work out well. Uh, if you have bare ground there, it doesn't work out so well. DEP has been very clear that they consider solar panels regardless of their installation method uh, as an alteration within resource areas, but they haven't issued any guidance as to how to apply the stormwater standards to solar projects. Uh, so we, and typically we would be looking at increased peak flow, 
um, a few of the other standards, but DEP doesn't really tell us how to, how to consider that in this case. Well, but it didn't, I, I, I agree with the analysis. He said, you know, if you've got a couple of acres of uh, space there, you're going to have the same amount of rain going into the same amount of space. It's just going to, it will come off the uh, panel. And so the part that's directly under the panel won't uh, receive the rain. Um, it'll, but that will be doubled up in the open space in between the panels, and so. But then it flows and, into that space and under the panel. slope, so right. that you know it all ends up. Uh, uh, uh. What what we found is with these um, the areas that you need to be careful about, and you, you certainly need to apply this you know very careful application of the stormwater standards are where you're changing cover type. So for example, we have a couple of areas where we're cutting down trees and we're turning it into metal. Um, so if you're familiar with stormwater calculations, it changes a curve number, mm -hmm. which indicates more runoff. So we have to take care of those areas. Um, we also have the gravel roads that we put in. Um, and that changes the cover type as well. So we go from a meadow to a, to a gravel road. Um, and then, which is one of the reasons that if you recall the grading plan, we have that little diversion berm. A little diversion berm right in this area, um, which is next to the area that, that we're cutting the trees down. And then right along the edge of the, um, uh, gravel road, we have a two foot wide by two and a half foot deep stone trench. So all the runoff that comes off the gravel will actually just sit in that trench uh, before it will eventually go over the top and, and run across the metal again. But we wanted to get a place for that to sit. Just to, to be clear, so these panels as angle uh, will obstruct a, a square area of land. Um, and I don't know how big I. Uh, Panels on my house. I assume these are roughly that size, but uh, I'm just trying to. So to, to the area of uh, exposed grass, uh, as opposed to the impervious area represented by the panels, is about 50 percent. Um, uh, the space in between roughly equal to. The it's, it's actually just a little. The space between is actually just a little bit greater. So for. Um, for purposes of the discussion, let's say that the, these tables where the panels are all mounted are about 15 feet wide. Um, the average spacing in between, it, it, it varies depending on the land slope. The average is about 17 to 18 feet. Some places it's 30, some places it's 10 to 12. Okay. There's a whole division of solar panel management rules and regulations. I, I wasn't even aware of that difference. Such an end there's, until I read your. There's more and more and more every, uh, every time we look. Well, you seem to be referring to um, set criteria. I, I assume they have a environmental yes. aspect of this division. Actually, that, um, the things that I refer to in that alternatives analysis and also in the, in the actual application document as well um, is a uh, memo that DEP put out. Uh, yeah. Wetlands Program Policy 17-1, and th there's a copy of it in your in your package. Yeah. But it it basically gives us the rules that we have to play by okay. um, when we're doing this work in and around not only in and around resource areas, but it also talks about the stormwater and you know the conditions for um, for having you know for making the statement that the stormwater runoff pattern will remain the same. Well, this is a separate entity within DEP itself. So. Um, I don't think so. I think it's I think it's still administered by the uh, by the wellness program. Hmm. Okay. Yep. So, so Mr. Fumbles. Other questions from commissioners? Um, what's the uh, time sequence on this? Uh, well, we'd like to start construction um, probably mid to late November. Um, and then it would take, a, a facility like this would take probably five to six months. That includes the connect to the... Yep, that's the five to six months grid. to turn the switch on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the way they do these is they basically, they do them in sequences. So it's it's almost like a series of waves. Uh, this is good enough. So what they'll, pro what they'll do is they'll start at one end of the site, 
and they'll have a racking crew come in. And all those people will be doing will be just be installing racks, and that's what they'll do. And we, when they get about here, um, the next thing they'll do is they'll have another crew come in that'll start actually placing those panels on the racks. Mm -hmm. So now you've got two crews moving slowly across the site. And again, short time later, um, another crew will come in and start doing all the wire and, and get everything wired up. So there's constantly different types of activities on the site. They, they try to get them, get them spread across there as quick as they can. Plus you have some prefab structures going in. We do. We have a couple of transformer pads, one here and one here. Um, we also have the switch mounts down here as well as uh, two areas for battery storage. So one of the new technologies with solar panels is um, lithium, lithium ion battery storage. So any excess power that's generated, the national grid can't take, goes immediately into that storage. When the demand on the, on the overall grid goes up, that battery storage can get out into the, you know, the grid. So you know, the fence installation crew working out there too. Yeah, those, those guys come in last. Yeah. Last or first? First. Let's get that exactly backwards. Security yeah, so everything else. That's right. So they get that they get that one. They keep the people out while this is going on. Other questions from commissioners? Questions? Comments from the public. Tag, it's me. Are you here from the neighborhood? No. He's actually with our firm. He's, oh, he's here right. to observe. So I guess I guess it's me to represent Park Hill Road. Do you have your um, name? Please. Can you state your name, please? Sure. My name is Jennifer Lerner. I live on Park Hill Road. I don't love this project, but I love this project. Uh, nobody loves seeing what's two fox families living there, magnificent animals. Owl, bear, thank you for the six inches. I mean, it, it's a big deal. Yep. Um, one of my questions is, can animals safely go over the top? Do, are you, did you have the any top barbed of, wire in oh, no, the no, top there's no of your fence? fence. Okay. Te te technically, um, we need you to address the commission. Oh, all the, right, okay. The, I want to make sorry, sure there's no barbed wire. <laughs> no, I understand, and we want to we want to make sure your question. No, and answered. actually, but we want to. You always want to avoid debate um, among okay. different parties. So if you ask us questions. The applicant will hear the questions and be able okay. to then tell us the answer, but it, that's right. just the way we're supposed to do So my biggest concern is this is, it's a rural area. This neighborhood has taken it on the chin for Northampton over and over again 50 years ago. We said, please don't give us that dump. We lost that battle. And then during those 50 years, please don't expand the dump. You're not, we're not going to expand the dump. It's been expanded. So we really, noise, etc. you guys are probably desperately familiar with the problems that the dump has made for some of the abutters in the area. I found them to be generally a good neighbor, except for sometimes. Um, I prefer this project to a cluster housing um, or a subdivision. Right now, it's a single lane road. Um, and it's considered a dead end, even though it does kind of go through gravel. I'm thrilled to hear, excuse me, I'm thrilled to hear that their project isn't gonna change much on our road. I want to make sure that the trees on our road are protected. I've got a big hickory out front, really, really close to that road. Everyone hates it. Tom keeps hitting it. I'm crossing my fingers that somebody will do something to protect the, to protect those um, while the project is happening. Um, the other big concern I have is for the safety of the people who are actually involved in this project. This, as you may know, is a, essentially a dead brook. Um, we used to be able to fish and swim in it. Once the dump went in, um, everything died. We've got a lot of leachate problems. It's also the brook that sits over the aquifer that goes into East Hampton. So the neighborhood has some concerns about what's being disturbed. It seems like not much is being disturbed, especially since they have changed it. I can't believe I'm speaking on it. In, in favor of an industrial project in my neighborhood, but I guess I am. So I want to make sure that somebody, anybody who has, can put some pressure on the, literally the guy standing there drilling stuff into the ground is gonna need to protect himself. And I wanna make sure that that happens. Uh, we know that a lot of real poisonous things were put in that dump over the years that it went online. And I just wanna make sure that people are wearing proper boots, masks if necessary, gloves, et cetera, to protect themselves. And that's part of why I'm okay with this project because you're not gonna keep kids from a subdivision out of that water. and. I, I don't want to see it just blocked off with a big hazard sign. Um, my other concern 
is um, I noticed that a lot of these places put, and maybe this is for the planning board, not you, I don't know, but I noticed that a lot of places like this, industrial areas, um, have audio and or video. Uh, right now, this is everybody in the neighborhood's calm walk through the woods. The idea that we might have to be on camera to continue on the road. If they want to put stuff in their property, great, but if it goes up and down the road, I feel that's a little bit of oh, you mean like surveillance cameras? Then? Surveillance cameras, exactly. Um, you know, we're not wearing our best when we're out walking our pumps. <laughs> <laughs> so just from, from that perspective. Um, and the other thing that we haven't really talked about here today is the other two lots that, that at, at this point in time, I understand there is nothing to do with or, or they don't have any specific plans for. Um, it would be a nice gesture um, for the neighborhood that's taken it on the chin. There's seven houses on that road, five of them abut or look directly at those two lots, which I want to believe are too steep for a fire truck to get up and have residential use, but we thought that before they put the other dump house up there. So I guess I would just sort of, if they're listening, those people I can't talk to, it would sure be great if you never developed those two lots. We'll be four year project if those two lots could just remain the last buffer zone between the dump, the Fedora property used to be the buffer for us, now that's got solar on it. Really, we're pushing our lives and the wildlife into that single lane road. If that could just remain untouched, maybe the town can keep the Chapter 61 on that, or I know that they're still negotiating with that. That would be, I guess, the, the, the street sent me here to beg for those two lots to remain as natural as they possibly can. So that's really my plus. I'm also wanting to say out loud that it's my understanding there isn't going to be any lights. Um, I understand the problem that they may need to add one pole or so if they can't do underground. Um, that would be great too. If, if our street doesn't become a big thoroughfare, we're willing to deal with the noise um, and disturbance. I'm thrilled to hear that it's only six months. Um, I can't believe it's coming out of my mouth, but I recommend that you guys approve this program with this project within what you can, can what can safely happen if we can keep it as rural as possible. Um, but it hasn't been mowed in 20 years. It probably will never need to be mowed. I know they're once a year, um, but I don't know what's going to happen once the, once the fox are, foxes are gone. It's going to be hard. So please leave those two lots to us, please. Really don't have that decision. I know. I'm. I, I'm not talking directly at them. I, I guess I'm just them. talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you. Sarah did say that the commission makes a recommendation on the right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and do, uh, but to to follow up a little bit on that, do transformers or any other parts of this generate sound? Nice question. There are. Um, if you stand next to the transformer, it will sound like you're but standing next to a room air conditioner. Mostly like transform on the telephone pole and that kind of thing. Yeah, except, except the difference is these are pad mounts, so you can get even closer to them. But it's about the same noise that you hear from a, a typical room air conditioner. Um, you go 50 feet away and you really don't even notice it. Um, and then of course at night, there is nothing because there's, there's, no, there's no power in there. Okay. The height of the fence is seven feet? It, it's, it's actually eight feet on the revised yeah. fence. Eight, 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 eight. Eight feet with a six inch gap. Six inch of gap. Yeah. What? What? Th th there's been some studies that have come out um, that start to debate whether or not the um, these actually are benefits to certain types of wildlife habitat because this mm -hmm. you get these panels in these wide open areas and all of a sudden some um, some wildlife are now shielded from predators. So rabbit populations that were previously getting grabbed by hawks shielded by the fence. Uh, no, they, they get in here, and so if, if you have an area where you have a lot of rabbits or small foxes or things like that, and hawks oh, are able to get them, by, by um, now, yeah. so not, not quite as easy. Um, and then, yes, shielded by the fence, so if they're being chased, right. they can get out of the fence. Although coyotes could probably figure out a way to get through six They will eventually figure out how to get under that fence. Understood. Other questions from commissioners? If not, um, 
Let, well, let me, um, is everybody, before we close the hearing, um, is everybody comfortable um, that we don't need to consider more thoroughly an alternatives analysis? I, I'd personally like some more time to look at that and, and the stormwater uh, issue. So we could continue um, rather than close the hearing. That'd be my personal preference. Is, uh, uh, um, waiting till the October 11th meeting problematic? Well, yeah, it, a, a little bit. Um, and I'll, I'll let Carter speak to the, the timing of this in just a moment. But um, with the, with the stormwater, um, I'm not sure how much additional review is. I mean, we, we do have a stormwater permit that was signed off. Um, yeah, that would be, I guess. <laughs> we, we just got sure the. Uh, it was a little late, though. Yeah. And when we didn't have time to review it or continue to consider it. Are there revised stormwater calculations that have been provided? To, yeah, to Doug McDonald? Yeah. Well, it, that, the stormwater is also jurisdictional under the Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that was really understood. No, it's, it's understood. So we, didn't, we haven't seen those calculations. OK. So all right, we can get you a copy of those. So if I may, just in terms of timing, um, this project is going to be under the new Massachusetts SMART program, which they've been saying is going to be released probably for the last four months. They've been saying, yeah, next week we'll release the order. That order came out yesterday. Um, and in that order, it said that the program opened yesterday. Um, now, the DOER, Department of Energy Resources, is pushing it back a little bit. But there's going to be a five-day window to apply when that does open, which could be as early as next week. Um, and if we miss that five-day window, there's a chance we might not make it into the program at all because there's such a backlog of development over the last two years or so of solar projects getting developed and permitted and working with the utility. Um, so if we could, I humbly request to close with whatever conditions you want. Um, you know, reviewing the stormwater, addressing those comments, just to be sure that we have the permits in hand to apply should that come before October 11th, which it, it could. Mm. I mean, I understand your issue, but we didn't receive a complete application with the alternative analysis and the stormwater. Is it possible to close it with a condition of your review on that, on those calculations? And again, we could um, make any changes. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the stormwater calculations, the, the change that we made was we added two other, no, three other points of analysis um, at the request of Doug McDonald, because what he wanted to make sure that we weren't doing is using this culvert at Hannah Brook to detain stormwater. So what we did is we gave him a point of analysis here, a point of analysis there, and a point of analysis there. The actual calculations themselves really didn't change. We just added some more detailed data. Um, the results of it don't change. The conclusions don't change. Um, you won't and, you, and you did get those original, the, the original stormwater management report. Hey, you won't receive city council approval for the chapter. The 61, no, we understand that. Yeah, the permits that we need to apply to the program, um, permits and approvals is the interconnection agreement, which we have in hand for the utility, conservation commission approval, and planning board approval. Um, so with those three, we can apply, lock in our place in the program, um, and then, as Todd said, build, hopefully starting in November. Oh. The uh, what do you think, sir? Is there a way we can condition it? Because the alternative analysis would be uh, a design question, not uh, necessarily a yes or no question. Uh, but might, might apply additional conditions. So if the commission agrees with the alternatives analysis that there aren't any other alternatives to what is before you, um, that's probably the most critical question because that would change the overall output of the development, essentially. If, if the commission were concerned about any development at all within the riverfront area and wanted to see right. something else, then, then that could potentially be a big change. Well, that was uh, my, my earlier question about you having visited the site. I, I can imagine uh, cases where within the outer riparian zone, you really don't want any even construction disturbance. And, and uh, uh, 
but if that's not problematic in this case, then this is minimal disturbance during construction and then none forever. And it is it is mown currently and there's no vegetation removal other than the, the hay itself within the pole areas that it's proposed to be removed. So that uh, was the, the reason why they are okay, but, you know, yes, we could uh, wade through more point by point, but um, it didn't seem like it's necessarily going to be consequential that uh, in, in, but uh, I, I'm, I'm taking staff's word for the uh, um, specific site because I haven't been out there. No. I haven't either. Do we have any data on the quality of Hannah Brook in terms of the cold water? I mean, I, I was curious about the sort of oh, reference to toxics in the in the dump, but in terms of a natural resource, or I mean, it does. It, they did sort of do a brief mention of no, no species, no significant species, but I'm just curious about the water resource. You might like contamination from, from yeah. The, from the yeah. I know, you know, I'm not familiar with that land in particular, but there's certainly post closure monitoring that someone is doing out there. Yeah, there's there are there. a couple of monitoring wells down here. And that certainly was within the surface water. And, and the then the, the brook itself here versus here is very different. So um, as it comes down, it basically turns a corner right there, right about here. Yeah. Okay, the, um, the bed of the brook turns bright orange. Yeah, so there's a very there's a very sharp line really? where the brook changes. It's like solid iron bacteria, which you normally associate with uh, runoff from from a landfill, and it's a very unpleasant odor. Mm -hmm. That's uh, you see a lot of iron bacteria. The quality of the brook is really not too good. And it, it is monitored for other contaminants by the Department of Public Works as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and Hannah Brook is considered a cold water fisheries resource. Interesting. Which part? I can't even I got the entire of the water away, but wow. I don't think we're going to the water right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I read the analysis. Though. You did? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. I liked it a lot better than the original. Than the original proposal, right. They really made an effort to try to pull yeah, as I, many I panels as they could out of it. I feel the same way that they did a valiant effort in the horizontal loopholes. So were these on any other type of base? I don't think it's something the commission can support. But since they're just a final pyramid, they might have just started to do it. I did have a question about the tree species proposed. Um, those yeah. are all upland species, mm -hmm. and the, that is a wet area and close to the river. So I, it, some of those may not be the, the best species. I, I'm open to suggestions on it. The reason we picked those, um, you're correct, they are all upland species, but the, the topographic difference between where we're planting them and the actual river, um, we didn't, I don't really think it gets all that wet in that general area we have there. Yeah, I, mean, I, I didn't want to call back down. it either way. I just want to make sure that you completely yeah. assess that because the planning board will require replacement after one year, but because these are in the resource area, you know, it's three years. Okay. Yeah, if, if it was down closer to the, to the river, we would probably make some other different selections, but where this is up in a, in a completely meadow area, where there's no tree right now. Well, I guess um, I, I'm inclined, uh, without having gone point by point, but just seeing the overall assessment and uh, before and after um, uh, plan changes. Uh, and with uh, Sarah's opinion about the uh, nature of the site, that encroaching that little bit isn't that much, uh, uh, isn't that problematic, especially given, as she just said, that 
the, the nature of the disturbance in the mounting structure and the uh, future use. I mean, this isn't like where um, this is going to be uh, somebody's driveway or something. This is uh, going to be uh, uh, quite stable as an environment once the construction is done. Uh, so I, uh, I'm, I'm inclined to, uh, to go without uh, further uh, work on the uh, alternative analysis, especially uh, <laughs> I usually uh, trust that uh, Mason's assessment of such things is going to be more sophisticated than my own. Um, uh, so that, that, that counts for me as well. On the other hand, we could move to close and you could uh, to oppose that, that it being said should continue, to, uh, but um, I'm, I'm inclined, given the, the, the sort of urgency of not wanting to sabotage the project uh, uh, and the comfort level that I at least feel with the uh, uh, plans as they are, uh, I'm inclined to, to close the hearing and see what conditions we have in the Continue. How does that sound, David? I, I would agree. You know, I haven't had the opportunity to go through that alternative analysis um, line by line, but like you mentioned, if Mason agrees with it, I certainly request the judgment and technical knowledge of those things. So, um, with that, uh, is there a motion to close the hearing? Second. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So, which, uh, which, what shall we uh, do by way of conditions here? Uh, the, the Sarah just mentioned the upland species uh, may not be appropriate for uh, all settings, and therefore the uh, one condition, additional condition would be that the applicant uh, would select in each planting case uh, the tree most appropriate for the site. Uh, it, it may be best just to, as well, I suggest that the condition that a requester certificate of money shall include an assessment of all tree plantings following three growing seasons rather than requiring the applicant to select something different. But as long as. Just make sure they're still here three years from now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if, if changes are to be made, I don't think that's something that we need to come back to the commission as long as it's not <coughs> Yeah, we, I mean, we would be willing to say that when we do the as built anyway, and we turn it into a stiff of lines, we'll show 100, I think it's 169 trees. It's whatever, whatever the number of built lines. I think it's, um, yeah, 169 living trees. And then the, uh, uh, the uh, commission will have to at some point accept the donation of the, is it 14 acres? Mm -hmm. 14.7. Um, do we do that at this juncture, Sarah, or is that a later step in the process? This would, so it's city council's decision whether or not to release the right of first refusal. Um, oh, I see. Conservation Commission typically provides a recommendation. You don't have to do that. Um, but that would need to be done at this meeting. I, I anticipate it will be on the October 4th. Yeah, and we and we have to deal with the 61A issues before we can before we can donate. Can donate yeah. um, so, our uh, what would be appropriate um, in that regard? The indication. I mean, normally, we are always happy to receive and regard as uh, conservation land. Do, do we want to receive conservation land that has an orange river running through it? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I better off with us than something. Better off with well, us than yeah. yeah, I guess that there's a yeah, across the river to the corner. I don't know where north is on the end to the north the northwest, but the I'm curious about is the two lots. The two lots. The reserve lots, but um, we could indicate to the council. Um, that because uh, uh, I think there's there's two elements. One is the the uh, uh, wishes of the neighborhood, which are always reasonable for us to 
consider, not if they could conflict with our charter, but uh, when they're not in conflict with our charter, uh, as we have in other cases. And the argument that, in fact, uh, uh, that, I had a picture in front of you before, uh, that that provides some, that provides some uh, uh, additional open space, um, which we are generally uh, finding uh, favorable for the interest of the Wetlands Act and for our larger responsibilities. Um, so we could urge the city to uh, uh, take into account uh, the wishes of the neighborhood uh, and the maintenance of open space as they act on this. Uh, is that a reasonable? Um, sure. Yeah, it's pretty or, or the commission could address the, the parcel on which the solar development is proposed and not make a recommendation on the other two parcels. And just a variety of ways. In, including our, whether we would stay silent for now and whether we would accept the conservation land? Uh, you, you could at this point if you feel you don't have enough information. But at, at least not address these other two parts. The council will do what they're going to do. Uh, yeah, I guess I'd, I'd be inclined to say that we have uh, um, we have heard uh, from a representative of the neighborhood that uh, there are concerns about um, uh, development in those parcels and to pass that concern along to city council. Uh, whether I, I don't know if the rest of the commission agrees that. Um, more open space is better than less open space, so you know, if we can say that in general it's something that we favor, um, then put it in the city council's lab to figure out what they actually decide to promote. But I, I, and I, I think I uh, would agree that we accept the, uh, the central parcel that they want to give us the 14 acres. Um, I can't imagine the downside, there might be one, but um, it may provide some, at some future time, there may be, uh, who knows, uh, between the, the landfill and the array to have that buffer may be um, valuable for us to have control. So I'd be inclined to say I will accept the, the, the parcel and I'd be inclined to pass along the, uh, to the council that we've heard concerns from a representative of the neighborhood that they, those two developable parcels uh, remain open and that we would be in the, in the spirit of maintaining more open space rather than less uh, uh, inclined to support that. But that's not something that we have jurisdiction on. Is that, is that I would second that motion. Okay. I agree. Um, any other uh, the the seed mix with which the uh, field will be populated? Uh, Sarah, you'd like to take a look at that? It just said a seed mix. I was going to say what specific. So when the time comes, there have, there be a condition that that be subject to uh, staff review and approval. Yeah, I think in the drawings there's an actual specific seed mix. Uh, in the, yep. some of the uh, plants. In, in these? Uh, I believe yeah. it's probably a sheet number two. Sheet number two. Seven point two. I'm still trying to find the plant. It's the second, second sheet. So it's I think it's titled kind of Two, two. C2? Oh, uh, how about zero? Zero point one. Actually, this is the second sheet. Sixty per sixty percent flat seed, ten percent red top, thirty percent perennial rice. Oh, I saw that. Uh -huh. I'm looking for the planting. Uh -huh.
that seem acceptable to you, sir? Site you anticipate will be um, right around 60,000, 60 to 65,000 square feet. So it would be the two areas where we're removing trees. Mm -hmm. So that central stand and the southeast corner. Acre and a half. equipment will be coming in from the west? Yes. Um, that uh, uh, any, uh, uh, I don't know whether significant in this case is the right technical term, but any sizable trees that are uh, bordering the road um, be armored. I've seen that in some recent um, uh, With a wooden, it's kind of almost like a vertical wood, snow fence. Yeah, yeah, like, like, like a snow fence. fence. Right. Is that something that you're working with? Is that typically needed? They it's might nice. require it anyway. I've seen yeah. that before. So we could add it as a, yeah. as a condition. Right. Yeah, if you use that wooden fencing, it works pretty well. For, you know, even if there's an inadvertent strike, right. um, yes. the wood slats take the, take the abuse instead of the tree. you got to replace the whole thing after you do have to get it once, but it's better than trying to figure out how to replace a tree that's sure. 30 inches in diameter. Any other conditions? Sarah, anything you want to ask? Uh, I would copy GPW's perfect conditions as well, just to make sure we're consistent. Yeah. Um, any annual annual mowing should be completed after September 15th, just uh -huh. to allow the nesting birds a chance to get out of there. Um, assessment of the tree plantings, and just because it's indicated that it won't be used, herbicides and pesticides shall not be utilized. Which gopher? What, what, I didn't get that reference. Oh, I, I even I listed it earlier, right of first refusal. Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> um, there will be more nesting sites now. Under the panels. Under the, yeah. All right, any other conditions, Sarah? You've captured all of those? Yes. In the minutes? So, motion to uh, approve with all of those conditions? Second. And a second? Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
So we'll go ahead. Thank you. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all very much. Look at your project. Uh, that case is going to be continued again. Marijuana fire. Yes. Uh, I'll refrain from the obvious joke. <laughs> <laughs> we have trouble with kids on the street, though. Yeah, no kidding. They'll be moving slowly. <laughs> yeah, running away very quickly. That's already. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see. You're going to have a lot of class. I know you'll be a good neighbor, right? Please will be quiet. That's what I'm really happy about. Thank you all. Any other? Somebody just had a move in second. Oh, what's up? Right. Motion to continue this uh, notice of intent for the marijuana facility. So moved. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> so these uh, people sell, like, is this part of the uh, moving entry and access group that, that's on Pound Street? Or uh, it is not. It's independent. This will be separate. Uh -huh. Uh, they have a change in financing, which would in an excitement change. So this has already been approved by the planning board, um, but it didn't make very much sense to come in, uh, in an order of conditions for something that they knew would be different. Uh, I guess that's an east end. Well, but there is that little one below. No, I'm not the main. And then there's a little one down below. Right. Right. Yeah. But is that a great use for the uh, old land? Well, I think, besides, I think yes. Besides, and besides farming of the methane gas that's coming out. Sarah, do we have other items? That's it from me. Um, we didn't get to our land. Regulations. Right. Right. Um, so for uh, October 11th, how is that looking for? Uh, the 610 items, there, there's a couple of smaller permits. The David Road thing, right? The David Road. Um, We'll have four hearings and also an executive session about the uh, Coles Meadow Road driveway. Um, but the city solicitor said only 20 minutes for that. So we have 20 minutes. I was um, wondering about that. What, yeah, that's yeah. Um, I'll probably also come to you guys for recommendations for the CPC meeting because there's some conservation things on that in the group of requests so I'll let you know how those are going. Okay. Um, good for the uh, October 25th meeting I won't be here on Viking in Israel um, for a couple of weeks. Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I'm an old retired guy. Uh, so uh, if we don't start the, the land use discussion um, uh, on the 4th, uh, probably doesn't make sense to do it until the first meeting of the month. I don't think there's a lot coming in after what we've already received. We don't have anything on the agenda. Okay. Well, we could at least for the second meeting. We can at least start it then. Uh, the, the, you and I can get together and talk about okay, what materials do we have already? What do we need to do uh, additionally? Um, uh, there was that uh, proposal that I put out about the steps that we go through and we can at least um, affirm that and take stock of what we have and um, 
collectively identify next steps, which then could include um, uh, approximately one to have a public hearing. Uh, there are election goals for those maps you sent out, sir. Yeah. See so all these colors, I kind of know what the green is, but there's all the, that's the border. Yeah, I wondered the same thing, but I think that big salmon blob is just the vicinity around uh, the roadways. Yeah. This, I guess with this house is another. She sent two maps. One. One was. Okay, so the, the red areas are setbacks where the fire arms discharge would be allowed. The green areas are conservation areas, and the, the darker, the ugly color is, is where they intersect. So these are, so along the edges, basically, the conservation areas, that's where they would be. Uh, uh, permissible. Yeah. So like, Fitzgerald Lake has a large area where you could discharge a fire arm. Uh, some areas are not. What's like the, the dark green? Dark green. Um, top, top there. Yeah, there's two little dark green parcels. Oh, and this one. Oh, that's where hunting is currently. Yeah, currently. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. What was the second one? Two. That was it. I sent that, and then a scan of what we put on uh, property boundaries. So I was chatting with our uh, director of wildlife. At of division and who's done a lot of hunting rights, work with towns on hunting rights. And one, he offered up staff again, which you guys said maybe it's not the you know the hunter ed sort of deer person in charge of the deer population discussion. Maybe it's a wildlife biologist. But anyway, but his other point that I thought was good is that towns. My own advice is don't get so complicated. I mean, don't tr track the state regs. Obviously, you know, we can be more restrictive or less open for hunting, but when you start to get too complicated to accommodate your public, it's unmonitorable and it's unenforceable. So you yeah. just, just don't get too complicated. It's better to just not have it rather than make it every third Sunday, not that day, but <laughs> another day. So. Well, I think the. The state laws are already restrictive enough that a lot of what people complain about is already illegal. You know, the, the frequent discharges, the loud noises, you know, that, that, uh, that's, if, unless people are doing it on their own private land as a target shooting, that, that's already illegal. They shouldn't be out there doing it. The night hunting, they already illegal. Uh, uh, rifles, people are worried about, already illegal. You know, it's sort of, if we can educate it's part of this process mm -hmm. about where the boundaries already are, um, that that'll take care of, of some people's concerns. Mm -hmm. But I agree, we, we don't want to get too tortured about uh, what we might allow or not. But we could at least uh, maybe target the fourth for the initial part of that discussion um, uh, and try to frame it on the agenda in a way that the public won't really show up. Because uh, we, we ought to have we ought to have a discussion among ourselves first about what we want the process to be. It's a camera. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're having a Trumpian discussion. <laughs> Casual. I mean, there are other items that we need to consider with the land use regulations, also. Yeah. Um, so it is. It isn't just something that's going to be revisited. Those. All right, motion to adjourn. Second.